Hello everyone. Welcome to a module on the cardiovascular system. In this module, we will talk about pressure volume loops and its associated valvular diseases. Okay. So let us first start with the basic concepts of the pressure volume loop. When we look into this diagram, on the y-axis, we have the left ventricular pressure and on the x-axis, we have the left ventricular volume. Okay, so this is the volume of the left ventricle and this is the pressure in the left ventricle. Is it clear? Now first let's talk about the basic and the normal physiology. When you look at this black loop, this represents a normal physiology of a heart. Now what is the normal physiology and what are the faces in the normal physiology which are represented in the pressure volume loop? Okay. So let's start with the first one. When we look at this point, this is the point that is the end diastolic volume. And here is the point where there we signify end systolic volume. Okay. So this is the end diastolic volume, which is the maximum volume present in the left ventricle. And this is the end systolic volume, which is the minimum volume present in the left ventricle. Now, during systole, there is an increase in the left ventricular pressure. So the left ventricular pressure increases without any change in the volume of the left ventricle. I again repeat, during systole or during the first part of systole, the pressure in the left ventricle increases, but the volume in the left ventricle remains same and hence it is called as isovolumetric contraction that means the volume remains the same okay so this is the isovolumetric contraction and the mitral valve closes in the start of the isovolumetric contraction so just before isovolumetric contraction the mitral valve closes and hence we hear s1 that is the first heart sound is it clear now when the pressure is increased to a certain extent and the volume starts decreasing or the blood is pushed out that means there is ejection of the blood then it is the second phase which is the systolic ejection phase so this is the second phase okay in which the blood is pushed out now this is the period between the aortic valve opening and aortic valve closing the mitral valve closes over here and hence we see the first heart sound. The aortic valve opens over here and hence the blood flows out of the heart and hence it ends over here. That means the aortic valve closes and hence the blood stops flowing. So this phase is called as the systolic ejection phase. The first phase was the isovolumetric contraction in which the pressure increases and then due to excessive high pressure, the aortic valve opens. After opening of the aortic valve, there is release of the blood. There is release of the blood which leads to decrease in the left ventricular volume. Okay. Now, when the aortic valve closes, we hear the second heart sound. Is it clear? So, when the aortic valve closes, we hear the second heart sound. After the closing of the aortic valve, we come to the third phase that is the first part of diastole. So these two are the parts of the first and the second step are the parts of systole and these three are the part of diastole. Is it clear? So when we come to the th third part that is isovolumetric relaxation in which there is no change in the volume. That means there is no blood entering, but the pressure in the left ventricle decreases. Okay. Now, when the pressure in the left ventricle decreases and after that, the mitral valve opens. Okay. And hence, the blood from the left atrium flows into the left ventricle, increasing the volume in the left ventricle. And that is the fourth and the fifth phase. Okay, so the fourth and the fifth phase is rapid filling and slow filling and both of them occur in the same line. Is it clear? Now the S3 and the S4 which are the abnormal sounds are heard in the fourth and the fifth phases. Am I clear? So this is the normal 
pressure volume loop of the heart. Now, when there is change in three aspects, that is contractility, afterload and preload, the loop changes. So let us talk about each of them, starting with contractility. When there is an increase in the contractility, I've already discussed in the module of cardiac output equations and cardiac output variables that when there is an increase in the contractility, the stroke volume increases, the ejection fraction increases and the end systolic volume decreases. That means the only part which changes is the end systolic volume comes behind okay so the end systolic volume decreases now due to the decrease in the end systolic volume the stroke volume the stroke volume is the difference between end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume the stroke volume increases okay and since the stroke volume increases the ejection fraction also increases so this is a very simple funda of contractility okay now let us talk about the second one that is preload now preload is kind of similar to contractility but in preload the end diastolic volume increases rather than end systolic volume decreasing so the end systolic volume remains the same but the end diastolic volume increases and again there is an increase in the stroke volume is it clear so in the preload, the end diastolic volume increases, whereas in the contractility part, the end systolic volume decreases. Now let us talk about the third one that is the afterload. Now what happens when there is an increase in the afterload? When there is an increase in the afterload, the pressure in the iota increases, okay, which resists the blood flow and hence it resists the stroke volume, resulting in decrease in the stroke volume. Now, how does the stroke volume decrease? There is an increase in the end systolic volume and hence the end systolic volume increases tremendously, decreasing the stroke volume. Is it clear? And since we know that the left ventricular pressure due to the increase in the end systolic volume, when there is completion of the systole and a lot of blood is in the ventricle, there is a increase in the pressure so this loop is kind of a different loop compared to the other three loops and is easily distinguishable okay so there is an increase in the aortic pressure decrease in the stroke volume and increase in the end systolic volume am i clear let us go to the valvular diseases the first valvular disease that we're going to talk about is aortic stenosis now, what does stenosis mean? Stenosis mean narrowing. It means narrowing of the blood vessel. Okay. It is somewhat like a afterload effect. Okay. So, since an afterload, we know that the end systolic volume increases and there is an increase in the aortic pressure. There is also increase in the left ventricular pressure. So please remember that the left ventricular pressure, this is the module in Wigger's diagram when we discuss that this is the left ventricular pressure and this is the aortic pressure. Okay. So the left ventricular pressure is very high. Now why is the left ventricular pressure very high? There is narrowing of the aorta, correct? And hence the afterload is increased. Now, since the afterload is increased, the ventricle has to give more pressure. So the left ventricular pressure is very high. The end systolic volume is also high. There's no change in the end diastolic volume as we have already seen in the afterload. And there's a decrease in the stroke volume. We can see there is a decrease in the stroke volume. Now, when does aortic stenosis, what, does, what are the clinical implications? They can be ventricular hypertrophy, which leads to decrease in the ventricular compliance. Okay. Now, due to this decrease in the ventricular compliance, there can be increase in the end diastolic pressure for a given end diastolic volume. Okay. So, there is an increase in the end diastolic pressure for a given end diastolic volume. Do you understand? So, you compare the end diastolic pressure it always increases. 
and hence there is ventricular hypertrophy. Now let us talk about mitral regurgitation. Regurgitation means flapping it back into the atrium. Okay, in mitral regurgitation, since the mitral uh, mitral walls are really weak and it can regurgitate back into the left atrium, there is no isovolumetric phase because when there is ventricular contraction, the blood can flow back into the left atrium. So there is no isovolumetric phase. Okay, so we see no isovolumetric phase. You can look at this part and this part there is no isovolumetric phase okay now there is a decrease in the end systolic volume and increase in the end diastolic volume which leads to increase in the stroke volume drastically okay now decrease in the end systolic volume due to the decrease in the resistance and increase in the regurgitation that means the resistance is decreased because the mitral valve is not strengthened properly and hence it can regurgitate back into the left atrium during systole okay now there is an increase in the end diastolic volume because the increase in the left atrial volume of pressure okay now there is increase in the ventricular filling which leads to increase in the stroke volume there is also increase in the ventricular filling because the end there is increase in the end diastolic volume am i clear now we also see a tall V wave in the Weger's diagram. Is it clear? So there is no isovolumetric phase in mitral regurgitation. Aortic stenosis resembles the afterload effect just that there is an increase in the left ventricular pressure. Now let us talk about the remaining two valvular diseases which include aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis. We have discussed mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis now we talk about aortic regurgitation and mitral stenosis okay so again in aortic regurgitation there is weakening of the uh, valves of aorta which leads to improper isovolumetric phase so there is no isovolumetric phase now there is increase in the end diastolic volume and in aortic regurgitation which is a classical example of a large pulse pressure module so when you look in the cardiac output equation module you learn about the pulse pressure so there is increase in the pulse pressure and aortic regurgitation is a typical example of increase in the pulse pressure with thyrotoxicosis and other examples okay now primary point is there is no isovolumetric phase and the end diastolic volume only increases Okay. It's not like mitral regurgitation where the end systolic volume also decreases. Here only end diastolic volume increases. Now let us talk about the last valvular disease that is mitral stenosis. In mitral stenosis, there is primarily increase in the left atrial pressure. Okay, So during systole, the left ventricular pressure is high. But the other times the left atrial pressure is higher than the left ventricular pressure now due to the increase in the left atrial pressure there is a decrease in the end diastolic volume and hence there is a decrease in the stroke volume is it clear now end diastolic volume decreases because of impaired ventricular filling due to mitral stenosis that is narrowing of the mitral valve there is impaired ventricular filling. The ventricle is not being able to fill properly and hence it results in decrease in the end diastolic volume. There is eventually a decrease in the stroke volume due to end systolic volume. Is that clear? So these are the typical findings that you have to remember and remember the graph structures of each of the valvular disease. Is it clear? So this is all about pressure volume loops and its valvular diseases. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the video, please click on the like button and do subscribe to this channel. Let me know in the comment section below which topics do you want me to explain. Thank you.